Hey, Lauren. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Good. Good. Appreciate all your uh, Cheers for Peers posts. Oh, yeah, no problem. Do you think they've turned out okay so yeah, far? Yeah, <laughs> they've been great. A lot of likes and everything. I think that's good. We'll do it every November. Yeah. Should be fun. I like your PowerPoint, the green. I know it's just changing things up. So number one, I want to thank you for picking this book because this book has been sitting on my shelf for a, over a decade, maybe 15 years, and I never read it. <laughs> and it was oh, sitting really? on my shelf. So time. I have, it's so funny. I have so many books that I've never read and you know we're in the fourth quarter it's time to talk about execution and what does it mean and this is like one of the best books about execution so i'm like i can't believe i've never read this and frankly it's an easy read like Good. the last couple book clubs you know some of them are a little difficult to get through but this one was like i got halfway through it like in two readings so oh, good. Good. that's how long this goes yeah, it got a lot of good stars. So I was like, it has to be pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I'll kind of walk through the story behind it and get going. So I'm going to, um, this should probably only be about 25 minutes, this video. So it's recording right now. And uh, we'll just go ahead and we'll record it and we'll get it produced and up on the uh, YouTube channel. Oh, um, perfect. We'll go from there. So um, you can see the screen, execution, the discipline of getting things done. So there's two authors. One is Larry Bozzati and the other one's Rem Sharon. There's actually a third author, author who's not really noticed. He's the guy who kind of put the book together. So these guys are thought leaders. They get interviewed. They put together um, thinking like that's the way to write a book, right? Have somebody else write it for you. But then they <laughs> your name gets on it, right? So a um, little background on these guys. If I can figure out how to go forward. Uh, I think I need to, I think I need to have it up in front of me. There we go. All right. So the authors are uh, Larry Bossidy and he's super famous, not super famous. He's slightly known from being a huge executive at General Electric. So General Electric is one of the most famous companies uh, from years past. Jack Welch was a super well-known CEO of the company and Larry Bossidy was one of his lieutenants, um, and then he moved on to Allied Signal um, and uh, ended up being Honeywell, right? So there's some mergers and stuff, but uh, highly successful in the 90s. Um, Good to Great, you might recall that book, came out 2001, maybe, something like that, end of 90s. Um, and then this book came out in 2002, um, and so there's a lot of discussion uh, using similar um, concepts, but I love the book. It kind of is story after story after story. They're all true stories about companies 
and they come courtesy of this dude, Ram Sharan, who is a consultant. So he consulted companies who were struggling with execution and leadership, and he also worked with some that were successful at it. So he's kind of got the full picture. And so you see Ram and Larry kind of going back and forth throughout the book uh, speaking, and they kind of identify this is Ram, this is Larry as they're speaking, um, as they tell stories. So it's pretty cool. And this just gives you a little background on those guys. Um, contents for today is we're going to go through the first half of the book and um, nothing really to be no noticed in the introduction. They just kind of lay out the groundwork of why they decide to write the book and all that. But part one of the book is why execution is needed and what that means. So we all know about strategy. We know about some of the different dimensions of business. But execution's kind of nebulous. What does it mean? How do you get there? So the first two things we'll talk about are the gap that nobody knows. So the gap between where we are and where we want to be. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about the execution difference. What does it mean to actually execute successfully versus not, right? So we'll talk about that. So that's part one. And then part two is really where the rubber hits the road. We start talking about the building blocks of execution. Um, and in that section, there's really three subsections and this building block one, two, and three. One is the leader's seven essential behaviors. So for those of you who have uh, been part of our previous book clubs, we did um, How to Be a Great Boss, where we broke down uh, leadership qualities versus management qualities and the difference between the two. Um, and so we'll touch on that again here in block one. Building block two, we'll talk about creating a framework for cultural change and what that means. Um, we all are trying to do that, especially those of you who are implementing EOS and uh, traction in your businesses. And then building block three, uh, the job no leader should delegate, having the right people in the right place. And that's a phrase that was, I was trying to figure out if these guys came up with it or if Jim Collins came up with it. And it looks like Jim Collins beat him by a year. So uh, about 21 years ago. So. Anyway, that's what we're going to cover uh, with today's uh, book club. So first we'll talk about the gap nobody knows. And they tell some stories. And in this particular year when the book was written, they look backwards a couple of years. And there was like a three-year period, 2000 especially we identify here, there were 40 CEOs fired or forced to resign out of the top 200. That's a lot. So I'm curious to see what that number looks like 20 years later, but it does seem like that is a significant number. Um, and so the question is, why? Why did? Why would you, why would one, 25% uh, of uh, all of CEOs get fired in any particular year, right? It doesn't make sense. So in it, they kind of say, well, let's talk about what that looks like. And they took two computer stories, and you guys are too young to know this, uh, but if you're an old timer, you'll know that Compact and Dell were kind of side by side and then Gateway, they were selling PCs back in the day and Apple was just getting going. So Apple had a small market share, but wasn't a primary player. Um, it was mainly coming through um, Intel chips and Microsoft products and so forth. Um, so Dell uh, had a success story by executing on their promise whereas Compact really couldn't get the execution part down. They had some great leadership in Compact, some people who have really proven themselves, but they could not uh, be agile enough to implement and execute the difference. So that's the gap between you know, what you want to have happen and what actually happens. And uh, for those of you in traction, I left this quote in, vision without execution is just hallucination. Uh, that was not used by, I don't think, Jim Collins or by these guys. Um, I think you had to wait until you got traction about 15 years later when you finally see that quote comes back. It comes from Thomas Edison way back when. Um, so you can see business principles last the test of time, right? So um, next one is um, executions comes of age. So this section of the book they talk about how most companies fail based on a lack of execution and focus, not on strategy or vision. So 
small businesses inside peer groups really got focused on strategy, 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 vision, um, and then they would hand it off to their team and the team would implement the change. Um, so what does it mean to get things done efficiently and effectively? Um, vision without the execution is not going to uh, get you to that end game, right? And we're dealing with that right now number of people not hitting their numbers in 2023. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So they describe execution. And by the way, you open the book up and there's uh, a nice first page, which is like almost like looks like a dictionary and it says execution, how to pronounce it. And then it gives you some definitions and uh, there's like eight in there. So it was kind of interesting to see how many different ways people use this word and, and what it means to individuals. So execution is a discipline and an integral to strategy. So it has to be part uh, tied to strategy. Also discipline uh, is pretty key word uh, in that particular sentence. They also talk about execution as the major job of the business leader. So that's different than what a lot of people have been internalizing the last few years with traction kind of saying, oh, execution is the job of the integrator. It's the job of the COO. Vision is the job of the CEO, right? So they're saying, hey, if you're the business leader, if you're the owner of the company, you need to be worried about execution. And uh, we'll talk about what, what that means, especially as it relates to rental. And then uh, execution must be a core element of an organization's culture. And that's different than getting things done efficiently and effectively, right? So it has more to do with like, do we have a culture of getting things done? Uh, so we'll talk about things like continuous improvement and uh, if you have processes that exist around that type of thing. So execution is a discipline. Um, going to that point, it's not just a tactical thing. And the heart of execution is um, understanding how the people process that you have the strategy process and the operations process are all linked together and that all becomes part of execution and whether you're you know um, jumping the gap and then um we mentioned their execution is the job of the business leader so heart and soul immersed in the company that is a statement about every business leader, it, they should not be aloof. Uh, aloof is something we talk about later. And um, uh, the business leader really has to be the heart and soul and be part of that. Um, some of the jobs of that person are picking other leaders, setting the strategic direction, conducting operations. And those types of things, those three core process areas, uh, they can't be delegated. So that's an important part uh, for people to understand, like, yeah, you can have an integrator, you can have somebody who's uh, a chief oper uh, you know, operations officer, but ultimately they tie back to strategy, which means that the business leader has to own it. Um, also, they ask tough questions, and that is very difficult for business owners. It's hard for me to do that, ask tough questions of our employees and get to the bottom of, you know, tying things back to the goals of the company. Um, they also set the tone of the company dialogue, which is interesting. So if you are a bully of a business leader and you don't have good communication skills, you may have a tendency to create an environment that is not going to prosper in that manner, right? You're not going to have great communication with the rest of the team between the team members if you can't do it you know, if you can't do it yourself as the leader of the company. Um, the other thing is be real clear, it's not micromanagement. So you're not looking over the shoulder of all your key reports. You're just asking the right questions of them and you're engaging in their work. Uh, they're doing the do, but you're actually going to be uh, interacting with them and asking them the questions. So final thoughts on this gap section, which again, very beginning of the book, um, execution has to be in the culture. And so they identify um, a couple things there. One is that um, if you have reward systems, um, it should be embedded in the reward system. So rewarding people with 
you know, bonus activity, things like that for um, executing on the goals and the plan and the and the strategy of the company. Also, it has to be in the norms of behavior, which could include, you know, how you have meetings. Do you do conversations with employees, that type of thing? Um, and um, continuous improvement, obviously, it's a process, right? So it's a process. It's got to go from point A to point B to point C to point D. It ha has to keep growing and moving the right direction. Um, also, you should be able to close the gap between actual and desired. So I can write down my goals for the year, but if I don't do something during the course of the year to make sure that we're moving the direction of those goals, then shame on me, we're not closing the gap. And so I, I run into that quite a bit with our members as well as with our own company uh, where we don't have forward progress for all the wrong reasons. It has more to do with we're not asking the right questions. We're not engaging on, um, you know, process improvement, right? Um, and so uh, the last part is why people don't get it. And part of the reason why people don't get it on execution is it's like rigorous and tenacious work of developing and proving ideas. So it's consistency, consistency, consistency. For those of you who are implementing traction and EOS, you're going to have some help there because you've set a time on your calendar every week to address it. And so those people are completing 25 big rocks, um, big projects in their company in a year, whereas others are kind of sitting with three or four in their head for six months and trying to make that happen. So, uh, you know, shout out to those that are, are taking time to do those weekly meetings that help you with execution. So the last part before we get into the building blocks is really focused on um, the difference. So what is the difference? So I love this part of the book. He just they break it into four stories. And so I was like, oh, this is great. And you just, I found it really easy to read through it. Um, you know, they talk about this first guy and these are clearly are projects that, you know, Ram Sharon had worked on uh, pro probably. Um, this guy picked the wrong person for the job um, as a leader inside the company. Um, and, you know, it was like, OK, what how do you make that? how do you fix that right so um you know what they're saying is in order for you to avoid that you need to include key people in the strategic plan um you, there's going to be non-performance issues always are in different businesses so what are you doing about it like are you going to kick that can down the street or are you going to take action so as a leader of the company you need to know how to coach those non-performers and gauge their forward progress, or you need to replace them and move quickly, right? So hire slowly, fire quickly, right? That kind of mentality. So that allows you to be agile and to improve the business instead of um, losing time on progress. So the one thing I read in that section, which I thought was good, was like, you would have to ask how more. Like, oh, you're going to do this? Well, how are you going to do it? So I think about like when we establish a rock for a quarter and, you know, it's got this, you know, how are we doing on it? Oh, we're on track. OK, how are you on track? What have you done up to this point? You know, how are you going to tackle that next challenge? Um, also, don't be afraid to set milestones for progress. So for those of you who use 90 IO or um, EOS, um, every rock, you should have milestones inside those rocks because you can't just wait 90 days and say, oh, we completed the rock and it's the best quality rock and everything's good. When I say rock, I mean project, right? So um, set milestones in between uh, and, and say, are we achieving, are we moving the right direction with it? So they kind of identified how it didn't work out for Joe um, and he had to move on. They next started talking about uh, Xerox, which you guys know are the copier company, and they have different services, uh, business services they provide. So there was a gap there. Um, they made a plan for the year, and it was a new CEO. And the idea was, hey, we're going to cut administra administratively because we have so many different business units all over the place. We'll just merge the back end and, you know, 
one administrative office will serve three business units and so forth and so on. What happened was it inadvertently had hurt the customer process and fulfilling the customer's needs. And so we had customer or we they had customer issues to address, but um, also the employees were getting pummeled because of those cuts. So uh, more work, you know, less pay or whatever it was. Morale drops off too, right? And the CEO was the person who set the vision for it. Hey, everybody on board with this vision. Yes, we are. And then he was too aloof. He was not able to stay connected with his leadership team. And so it was a big to do, big problem. And, you know, when something like that goes wrong in a year, you don't lose just one year. You're typically using, losing two to three years. If you think about a sports team who hires the wrong uh, head coach, you know, they don't really bounce back right away. It usually is going to be a process. So keep that in mind. But it was great, uh, you know, not success story, right? So um, the next two stories, one was Lucent Technologies, which you guys might recall the name that name from way back when um a gear was a newer name of it um but they were uh you know westinghouse and at&t and they they were merging all these business units and changing their name and the culture was stuck um they were missing milestones they had unrealistic goals and uh one of the big ones was they really didn't know their place. They didn't know who they were, what they wanted to be. And so they didn't, they, they were getting gobbled up by the outsiders. The external threats were just having at them. Um, and ultimately, uh, this other part was they had so many business lines. They were going too many directions. Oh, I wrote too wrong. Too many directions at once. Um, and so leadership there was just a mess, right? They were probably one of the biggest bust of any business that we saw back in the 90s um, was losing technology. Now, counter that with Ross Perot and, and you know, he ran for president, but he was also owner, founder of EDS. EDS was moving into management consulting at the time. They just, they don't have this in there, but I wrote it, read the tea leaves. They, they knew how to read the tea leaves. They were very much aware of external uh, markets and trends and did a great job of altering their business model. And they had to change the culture to go with that, and they were able to do that. So they have this leader. He was a proven ex executor. Um, he was able to get things done. Um, so they changed the culture to accountability and collaboration, and they included like all their managers in this process of creating this new vision and culture. There was all sorts of communication channels that were open for feedback. Um, and also uh, they focused on data um, and getting feedback back into the hands of their leadership team, which was a great move. You know, metrics and dashboards and uh, scorecards have been happening like crazy for the last 10, 20 years. But back then, um, you know, instead they would wait for a month or a quarter to get certain data. And EDS, came, the leadership came in and made that happen where it was like, here's some weekly data to give you a picture of how things are going. Um, so it created a, kind of a culture of confidence. And so that was fostered and it was promoted. If people took action, they're recognized for taking action and promoted, um, but there was accountability inside of that. So just a really nice story, a success story of, of how execution worked in that company. Now we move on to building blocks. And the first building block was uh, the seven essential behaviors. So this is a leadership thing. Um, I'm going to go over it briefly. I don't want to spend a lot of time because this is, we have other uh, quarters where we focus on people and people development. But the key here, they say in this section, and I really enjoyed it, was follow these seven essential behaviors and it will help you. So number one, know your people and your business. Um, just being a good study and understanding um, all the skill sets your people bring to the table and understanding what your point of your business is. Um, insist on realism. So that goes for everybody. That's top down. It's if you see it, then speak it. Um, if you're seeing things that don't make sense, if other people bring it up, uh, you know, reward them for bringing it up, create that environment where you're getting realism uh, over, um, you know, just happy clouds and and 
and happy stuff all the time. So um, you want to set clear goals and priorities um, and discuss that. And that comes from the leadership team. You want to be a follow through person. Uh, make sure that you do follow through. You want to reward the doers. Mentioned that earlier. Um, you want to expand people's capabilities. And the way you can do that is with different tools, um, giving them data, giving them um, training, anything they would need to expand and get better at what they do. And then lastly, it is to know yourself. And that section uh, kind of went into, you know, having a good talk with yourself about being authentic and um, having a self-awareness uh, of your strengths and weaknesses. Take a chance, take a time to do that, look at that. Um, you want to do some self mastery. So, what are you doing to improve yourself? What are you reading? What do you? Wh how do you spend time? What do you put your mind on? Um, having humility and knowing what your strengths are, and being able to confess your weaknesses and have other people know that, so they can help you. And then uh, the last point is not one of them, but it's said in the paragraph at the end. Pay attention to experience. So, a lot of us have been in the business for a long time. You've been there, done that learn from your mistakes, learn from your past, right? So that's a key component of being a good leader. So next, framework. So that leadership piece is important. It's the people side of things, creating the framework for cultural change. If you're going to come in and be the new leader and you've got new strategic plan, you've got new initiatives, you're trying to convince your board of directors of a certain thing. You're trying to convince your employees of a certain thing. You're trying to convince your vendor partners of that you, of a certain thing. So you, how do you do that? So one thing they talk about was operational culture. And that's actually taking the culture side of your vision and seeing it in place inside your company. So what systems are in place, a lot of people systems, a lot of HR elements. So old EDS beliefs versus new EDS beliefs, they kind of go through um, how EDS has changed, um, especially as it relates to here's our new strategic plan in order in the face of challenges. Um, how, what are we going to, how are we going to do this? So um, the way I look at it for a lot of our companies um, right now, small businesses, is this idea of communication and you know in the past it was hey i do an evaluation of employees and their performance annually um or i do it semi-annually um some of you might remember way back when when i say when you hire somebody you should you know review their performance weekly for the first month monthly for the first quarter and then quarterly for the first year and that really helps establish a glue to your expectations and their performance um they're actually suggesting now with people with operational culture you know surveys feedback mechanisms um regular conversations documentation around conversations all that kind of stuff um, they also get into linking rewards to performance, which I think is great. I think there's not enough bonusing that happens based on uh, performance items. Um, also, social software of execution. Um, social software is this idea of the soft part of um, execution. So that would be related to values of your company, your mission statement, um, your unique selling proposition, USP, your three uniques, uh, who you are as a company. So any of those pieces around your vision that then can be uh, moved down through the culture of your company, right? So, and the operating mechanisms are um, going to be that. They're going to be like, hey, we're going to have um, just a coffee meeting once a, once a week for 15 minutes. So we're going to have some kind of um, gathering of team leaders at the end every Tuesday afternoon or something like that. Uh, the import, importance of robust dialogue. So in that section, they talk about being open and honest and fair and be able to be vulnerable and not have consequences around it. Um, and that's always going to be a challenge to create that type of environment. I've seen it exist and recommend that you know you get whatever you need to get to get yourself to that point uh, whether it be books on the topic or some kind of lessons you could learn from it um, 
And the other part to that is leaders get the behavior that they exhibit and tolerate. So um, if you're going to be a good old boy or you're going to be best friends with your employees, um, they're not going to hold their employees accountable either. So, you know, think about that in terms of how you are with your leadership team and how that relates down the line to other groups of employees. So that is the framework. Getting near the end here. Uh, this is the building block number three. Uh, which again, are these are the building blocks that get us to the next section. Um, the job no leader should delegate um, is focus around having right people in, in the right place. So they claim that the CEO, the visionary, the primary execution person needs to be tied to getting the people in the right spot. So why the right people aren't in the right spot spot is always been a question for me and for probably a whole bunch of different business owners. There's really these key ones. Number one, lack of knowledge. So if I am putting someone into a position and I haven't done my due diligence on their own abilities, right? They have the capacity to do the job. Um, do I know that? How do I know? Is there a way that I could find that out? Could I look at to their past and their positions? Could I ask questions of their past positions to have an understanding of if they have the capacity to do the work? Um, too many of us don't do that, right? We hire people based on a very superficial look and we don't necessarily dig into, you know, is this the right person? Is it real? Are they really going to be able to achieve what's needed for that role? Um, the other one is lack of courage. Again, like promote, promoting internally. Right. Um, uh, lack of courage essentially means, especially in the mid level, um, is, well, gosh, I don't want to go. I don't want to go digging there. Um, I, if I throw up a stop sign here, it could create a problem. Um, same thing goes with the next one, psychological comfort factor. Like, hey, this person's like me. So that means I like them and therefore they should be able to get the job done because we'll have great communication between ourselves and we'll get it done. But ultimately, it's you can't hire based on your comfort with someone. It has to be that that person fits the position, what's necessary for that position. Uh, so between lack of courage, where you're not taking action, um, just because it's easier, it looks better uh, on paper to do it one way versus putting a stop sign up and not making that higher. Um, and then psychological comfort of the person having a behavior like yours. So bottom line on that, if you look at those three above it, it's a lack of personal commitment. So whenever there's a wrong hire, it has to be on the shoulders of the person on top who did the hiring, right? The, and it's going to be the leader of the company. So that's kind of the plan. Um, there was a second part to that section, which is, you know, what kind of people are you looking for? And um, this kind of is a little bit confining, but um, I get it. Like, do they zap people or are they energizing people? So you can kind of see that in, in different behaviors. Uh, a lot of that has to do with your values too. So if like in peer groups, we have a value called enthusiasm. And if somebody's not enthusiastic, I want to get to the bottom of it. And I definitely don't want them sticking around much, right? Because it can only um, fester inside the, comp in the company and the culture. Um, uh, also, these people are decisive on tough issues, um, which again is a hard hiring process. It would be great to ask that question. Hey, can you give me an example of a time when you were decisive on a tough issue, right? Something like that. Um, they get things done through others. So anyone who comes to you and is speaking to you in terms of implementation, not on their own shoulders, but on others, um, that's pretty good. That means that they're able to delegate appropriately and get more productivity than just an individual's productivity. Um, and then lastly, they follow through. So that has to do with detail and being conscientious and uh, not an easy thing, not my strength, right? So that's something that uh, I would say is it's hard to get to, but those are successful people, those that have those types of qualities. Um, how to get the right people into the right jobs. There's an unvarnished truth 
um, and that is that you put in the energy, right? So, um, you know, we're all worried about bottom line. We're worried about productivity. We're worried about delivering um, our services in a timely fashion with high quality to our customers. Um, but you can't underestimate the value of slowing down the bus and spending time always looking at your org chart, your accountability chart, looking at um, the expectations you have for those roles and getting them to achieve their goals, right? So that's a big part of execution, you know, hence the people side. So next time we're going to get together in a couple of weeks and we're going to do the second half of the book. Um, we're going to talk about building block three which are the three core processes of execution. And with that, I will leave you on a cliffhanger till next time. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being there, Lauren. Yeah, that was oh, great. Oh, Demita was there. Nice. I didn't <laughs> know we had people in. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, okay. Awesome. Well, appreciate it. And I'll see you in a couple weeks.